Good evening, everyone. I am Susma Sharma Gurumayum, author of this book of poems called In Finite Days to Come. I will be in a conversation today with Monlumo Kikon, who is presently an MLA in the Nagaland Legislative Assembly. He is the author of three book of poems. The first one, which was published in 2018, is called The Pen Me Poems. The second, which is called The Village Empire, was published in 2019. And the latest, which was published this year by Rupa Publication, is called Sling Stones. So uh, we will be talking about those books. One thing I want to ask uh, Kikon is which of these three books is your favorite? If, if you have any favorites, which of these three books is your favorite and why? Thank you. And uh, uh, I'm very glad to be part of Kalinga Lead Fest. Uh, although online. And um, I'm also grateful to Dr. Susma Sharma Guru Mayun, Mayam, uh, who has uh, volunteered to uh, be in this conversation. And not only that, uh, she is a poet herself and uh, from the state of Manipur. I would uh, say that I don't have a favorite among them in that sense. I, I like all of them for different reasons. And all of them were written based on different experiences. So given that, yes. uh, I would say that uh, it's a, if you look at the pen me poems and then you go to my latest uh, sling stones, uh, they are of different kind and they deal with different subjects. Although uh, pen me poems more uh, personal, and it is, uh, you know, the, uh, I, I try to write about the conversation with my late wife in the poetic form. And uh, also uh, it's, it's for, written primarily for my daughters. And um, usually I write for myself, I don't write for any audience. And, and suddenly I realized that I've written a collection of poems and uh, I want to publish um, uh, because um, I think that uh, right now the idea is to share the poems that we so um, deeply cherish and write. And I think it's the same for many. Um, I would I would like to know from you as well, you know, how, uh, if you've read all the three of them, which one do you uh, identify most? I would not say like the most because yes, like any parents, you know, I, I uh, you know, don't want to give preference to any of the creative output that we have, uh, you know, come up with. So which one? So yes, yes, yes. I have read uh, all the three poems, and uh, I read the po me poems. Actually, was the first book which came out of you, uh, yeah. and then Penny poems is the first book I read of you. And I somehow, I don't know if I'm very emotional, but I somehow gravitate towards that when I think of emotions and love, mm. because like uh, that 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 is a book which made me cry, oh. and uh, as. I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm a student of medieval Indian history. My PhD is on uh, medieval architecture. So Taj Mahal is very significant to me. Mm. So I feel this many poems. I, I have this book here. So <laughs> this book, I wow. feel this book is like a Taj Mahal in a written form. Okay. So for me saying that is the best compliment which can come out of a history student. So thank you. Uh, Penny poems for emotions. Uh, mm. yeah. And, uh, but then there are certain lines from the village empire and from sling stones, which, uh, which are my favorites. I mean, as, as a book and as, uh, as uh, looking in, into the poems, I like the penny poems, but uh, looking in certain lines, which I've like written down, I like sling stones and the village empire, which we will be discussing about later. Yeah. Um, thank you. I, I would uh, say that, you know, uh, penny poems is uh, not so much an ode to love, it's more, uh, you know, in memoriam kind of uh, poetry, uh, which Tennyson wrote. But it's it's also in a conversation uh, which uh, 
includes our shared um, hope and expectations from the children that we had. And therefore, when my uh, wife died, I, I decided that I should pen down our conversations and uh, so that my kids will read it. And also because they were very young and they wouldn't remember all the experiences they've had with uh, my late wife. Uh, when they grow up, I feel and I expect that they should uh, be able to read it and identify with uh, those emotions that uh, my wife had. And the conversations that we had uh, for for her beloved daughters. So uh, yeah, yes, yes. Uh, moving on to village empire and sling stones, uh, they are different in nature, as you rightly yes. pointed out. They are uh, 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 you know uh, reflections on you know the present, the past, you know, you know the contemporary and not the history. So it's more impersonal it's more objective it's more uh, i mean subjects are different so yeah mm -hmm. i would like to agree to your comment uh, on yes. the of them. so yes mr kikon so i want to uh, read out two lines from the village from this poem called deaths in the village empire mm. which uh, you know there's when you are reading a book when you're reading a poetry book or a prose book you were reading, 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 and you come across certain lines, and then you're like, okay, close my eyes and think about it, right? So I came across that line in the first poem itself, which says, a muscle is so difficult to move when the mind is bland and heavy. So this is uh, something which all of us feel, all of us know, but I had never seen this written, written down. So when I saw it written down, I was enlightened, mm -hmm. and I kind of stopped and thought about it. So if you can say a little bit about how this line came up in this poem and what do you think about this two line? That a muscle is so difficult to move when the mind is bland and deep. So, I mean, you're a poet yourself. So you would know that uh, while writing poetry uh, and the very egg of writing poetry, you know, takes you to um, another level of, uh, you know, uh, thinking. And you're reflecting on the various, you know, uh, things that moves you, touches you, you know, things that impresses you, and and sometimes uh, you want to um, reflect on the sublime. And in the process, uh, you articulate uh, your things, uh, your your thoughts, uh, you know, in a certain way which you 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 know identify with. This was something which I know everybody experiences and, um, you know, in any given moment while you're sleeping, while you're playing, uh, uh, you know, because I'm also a, a footballer. So, you know, while, while you're playing in the field and, you know, as a result of your exhaustion or, you know, sometimes in the dreams you, when you are uh, because of some physical issues, uh, you suddenly feel that you are trapped, you know, and, and I'm obsessed with uh, the notion of claustrophobia and how it impacts uh, your mind and uh, how it also limits your, uh, you know, movement. And sometimes uh, it, it has lots of, uh, uh, you know, connotations which we are not really exploring. So I thought that this was something which would express that, that, you know, in... Yes, in yes, yes. Yeah, capturing. Uh, yeah, it did, it did express yeah whatever was said, and I want to also uh, read out the last uh, two lines from uh, this poem called "Deaths." It says, "It's a trap right from the beginning to the insufferable end." And what I noticed, uh, Mr. Kikon, in most of your poems is the last two lines, or mm. two lines in between, two lines which just hits, which impacts, and which stays. So that is uh, brilliant. And please tell us about that. Thank you for saying that. Uh, uh, as a history uh, professor yourself, uh, you would know how um, events are recorded and how uh, the entire buildup is based on uh, separate and disparate events, which uh, actually come, uh, you know, uh, close to a proper explanation of any event at the end because I feel that uh, 
being influenced by poets like Poe, you know, having read Oscar Wilde, and you know, having uh, enjoyed their wit, and also um, their creative processes were quite different. But um, the attempt has always been to search for meaning where there is no meaning. You know, to to ensure that uh, any event that you want to write about, any idea that you want to write about, uh, must be articulated. And and sometimes yes, in the conclusion it is there. But I don't necessarily uh, agree, uh, you know, with your point that it's always the last lines. It's sometimes the first line as well, and sometimes you begin from the top or you begin from the end, and you know, uh, it just comes out. And, um, you know, for instance, um, there is an event, a uh, horrific event or a good event. Everybody rushes to write about that event. Mm -hmm. And there's always this rush to come out with something which is relevant, which is, uh, you know, uh, an event which impacts people's lives or a majority of people. And poets are challenged to write. And therefore, uh, sometimes it's... Uh, only when you let time pass by and, and, and when you allow that reaction to uh, stay on for some time and you work on that reaction, then you come up with a lot of uh, meanings that you could not have thought at the moment when the event happened. Maybe it is a tragic event, maybe it is a historically important event, Maybe it's a happy moment in your life, whether it's personal, political, historical. I think you have to let it flow for some time, you know. Uh, and that's why I feel that most of my poems are addressed uh, in a particular manner where uh, I try to either start at the beginning with um, the fact of the matter or build up, uh, you know, the entire structure uh, to come with uh, a befitting uh, conclusion, uh, which which would be you know <clears throat> based on uh, the first stanza or the first line that I write. So yeah. So so like in the village empire, we have a poem called the village empire. Yeah. But in sling stones, we don't have a poem called the sling stones. <laughs> That's a good point, <laughs> but it's not for a particular reason, you know. Sometimes uh, there's one poem in a book which becomes the title of the book. Sometimes these, the entire gamut of uh, poems that you write, which is synthesized in one word, like sling, sling stones. Because sling stones about, uh, you know, the struggle of a people. Sling stones about the history of people and how various interactions with various ideas, various different people, culture have impacted uh, and shaped the history of a people. And, and it's something which uh, is representative of uh, my culture. And therefore, uh, it is uh, a, a very apt uh, title that I gave to the set of poems that I wrote. And, and I feel that uh, I didn't have problems with the village empire because it was just one of the poems. And when I say village empire, you know, I'll give you a context. Sometimes uh, some, of my, some of my friends ask me uh, whether you are known well in the state of Nagaland. And I say, yes, I'm world famous in my village. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> so in my village, you know, I'm just trying to say that essentially everybody knows everybody. And, uh, and, and the whole drama around the society, around the village, or around even your uh, small circle of, you know, uh, of friends is something I wanted to catch up. So it was easier because the poem itself and also the title itself represented the entire body of work in the village of Pyre. Whereas in Slingstones, mm -hmm. I've already explained that uh, it was a different uh, subject altogether. Mm -hmm. Sir, so, so in Slingstones, do you have a favorite poem, which I would love for you to read out for us, for the audience? I, uh, no, I'm not trying to be safe, uh, about, but uh, I do like a lot of uh, uh, the poems there. I, in the sense, you know, it was uh, uh, an expression and an effort 
to bring out many of the teams that uh, sometimes we face, you know, uh, as a community. So, but I would say that to be on the safer side, I like the sesame seed more, you know, because I like, uh, you know, as we grow uh, older, we tend to like our own food more and more uh, as compared to other food. And uh, food culture is something I am totally into these days. I'm learning about, you know, the process of making various dishes and how I'm also amazed by the number of dishes we have, you know. Mm -hmm. it's, it's plenty for... Uh, <laughs> uh, anyway, so that's the reason yeah, so why I like this poem. If you want, I can read it out for you. Please, please, please read it out for us. Okay, sesame seed. Just give me a moment. Yes. <clears throat> Sesame seed retrieved from the cash cash for a somber occasion, crushed in a wooden pot with a handheld wood, wooden pestle, regulating force with steady pressure as the water boils over the firewood and the sooty aluminum pot, receives the pulverized black seeds, it dissolves like salt into the simmering pot pork, red and soft with chili powder, wiry pieces of dry bamboo shoot dancing with bubbles of hot water, a fire burning as more logs are shoved and flame rises up and the smoke dissipates. A relish, a taste, a delicacy, a recipe, all forced on fire, sprinkled with sesame seeds. Beautiful, Mr. Kikon. I'm a vegetarian and my mouth is watering. After <laughs> This is what poetry does. <laughs> yeah, it's about uh, one of the favorite uh, dish uh, uh, of the Nagas. And, and uh, every almost every tribe uses sesame seeds. Uh, but the way we cook it is, is uh, uh, you know, very different. Of course, uh, the, the relation of... Um, you know, uh, while cooking sesame seed with uh, meat, um, it's important to know what amount of fire uh, and, and also, uh, you know, how many logs of wood you have to uh, put in. And you have to crush the seed and put it as a paste. And also, um, it's very important um, to know the timing of, okay. you know, when to put eat in the dish and uh, also going to put salt in the dish so these are everyday experience of uh, you know the uh, our people uh, when they cook and uh, i wanted to capture that. also i wanted to capture a dish which uh, uh, you know sometimes we we generally ignore the process of cooking when we are writing yes, poetry, yes. sometimes we think it should be about uh, flowers and beauty and uh, issues. But sometimes, uh, why don't you just linger on uh, the beauty of cooking itself? And, and because we like our food so much, I wanted to write the process of cooking uh, one such dish and using one such uh, item, which is very popular among the Nagas. Yes, Mr. Kikon, beautifully, the, the process of cooking is beautifully captured in this poetry. Yeah. Uh, and there's one poem uh, which I love, especially its title, because it's very ironic, you know. It has privilege and it has suicide mm. in the title, like privilege of suicide. So the fact that you thought about it and you the title itself is cap very capturing and uh, if uh, I'm allowed, can I read this poem? Please read it, yeah. Uh, it's called The Privilege of Suicide. There is no end to the stillborn, celebrated in grief as it is, wrapped in muslin, imagined, readied for a farewell, the vapor of breath afloat in the air, only ascent, the essence. So it was to him that dreamt a war so unwanted, wounded 
yet he ran. Into a cave, no weapons. Into a cave where no weapons could pierce his heart. And having found shelter, he did what his enemies ought to do. He ended his only life. So Mr. Kikon, the title itself, it has privilege and it has suicide. How did you think about it? How, two, two very different things. Like I, I cannot imagine someone putting suicide and privilege in the same line. And as I said about your other poems, the last lines here, and having found shelter, he did what his enemies ought to do. He ended his only life. What I was trying to say in my previous uh, questions mm. that uh, your last lines are always, you know, penetrating. This one is like, it started from the title itself. Mm. So this is one of my favorite poems from your uh, collection, Mr. Kikon. And you want to say a little bit more on it? I've read it out for people to hear too. It's, uh, I mean, poetry is about uh, unraveling the contradictions uh, of, of yes. Uh, yes. In any theme that uh, you want to uh, work on. And in this particular case, I was imagining um, a privileged person, like a king, like a ruler. Mm -hmm. um, and in the present context, like a chief minister. Mm -hmm. And um, not um, any particular one. I'm just looking at the privilege of that position. So when you are uh, cornered, when, when you have lived a privileged life, and when in your you know, mind, you think that uh, mm, your identity is mm -hmm. entirely uh, wrapped by uh, you know, that uh, privileged mindset, it is difficult for you to accept number one, defeat. Number two, mm -hmm. uh, position where you're cornered uh, because of you know, your own follies and because of uh, policies which may not have been uh, favorable you know to the people that you serve so that is the uh, the um, you know the reason why i use the word privilege so it's general you know uh, use of the word privilege but why did i use suicide it's when you are born it's when you feel that the identity that you loved and preserved and promoted and you know um, um, took ownership of uh, is challenged and when you are about to be stripped of it there are people whose egos have actually um, blinded them and there are people um, where you know power has blinded people uh, blinded them so when that situation arises sometimes uh, you live beyond reality and therefore, uh, uh, the only way you can imagine yourself uh, um, to be in a position of defeat, to, to, to be uh, in a position where uh, your glory is, uh, you know, slipping away from you, that is when you take shelter away from your enemies. And because it's too much for you to bear the loss of your face or your privilege, the only way to... Uh, respond to that and and this is just my imagination this is, this is uh, but there are instances in history as well uh, you know it's uh, uh, about uh, people who've been autocratic you know there are instances in history I, I wouldn't want to get into that but uh, the simple act of suicide okay. is uh, to escape you know, in a situation like this, is to escape death from the hands of your enemies. And that is pride itself. And that pride comes from that thinking that you developed as a privileged uh, person. So, of course, it's uh, metaphorical, but uh, I was thinking about this particular situation when I wrote this poem. So, you're, you, you, you are right. Uh, there are always the unre unraveling of contradictions that we want to, you know, Dwelling. I'm sure you must have done that in your poems as well, which we will talk about after some time. Now, I'll... <laughs> yeah. Yes. Before that, yeah. An another poem, uh, and you know, I I said how sometimes you're reading a book and then you come across sentences and you like stop. Like these words are brilliant, brilliant. 
So that happened in uh, Village Empire, and that that ha- that's happening here in Sling Stones also. Mm. So there's this poem in Sling Stones called "A Disturbing Dream." Mm. Yes, and I want to read the second stanza of the poem because this is terrifying. The thought you expressed here, Mr. Kigon, is terrifying. I don't want to. It's horrifying. I don't want to even think about it. Mm. It says here, <clears throat> "Insane dream of people dead and gone." of triple murders committed and a murderer seen in heaven strolling the jade garden with saint paul discussing the meaning of faith <laughs> so the murderer is seen in heaven it just destroys faith uh, for me it destroys faith and this is one of the most terrifying sentences sentences that i have ever read in my life because when injustice happens to us we think okay fine heaven in heaven karma will take care of it or god will take care of it here god is not even taking care of it because the murderer is there in heaven talking about faith so this is a very terrifying thing this is a very terrifying situation so uh, was your intention to terrify your readers when you wrote this how did the and this sentence itself is very beautiful mr gigon the murderer is seen in heaven yeah i'm i'm uh, particularly uh, mm, i mean in agreement with you on on, on that point but however <laughs> i always i always felt that uh, we should challenge ourselves with the ideas that we are not comfortable with we should go beyond our comfort zones and think about things which has happened in history um uh, both to your people and also uh, to so many people across the world i mean the okay. history of human civilization is full of violent you know uh, uh, conflicts and um, until you know uh, democracy came uh, we have seen a lot of uh, violent conflicts all over the world uh, but in the recent past as well in spite of uh, the the efforts of united nations we've seen we've seen many um, such um, horrible events happening you know um, to name one example between the hutus and tutsis so when you think of all this conflict and uh, because we are busy with our respective professions and careers and we want to uh, sweep you know um, such events under the floor i think it is sometimes necessary to take our readers out of their slumber and okay. let them think of uh, those things that have uh, gone past which are horrible which should be condoned and i think uh, the duty of a poet is to you know um, challenge your mind from uh, your comfort zone and to lead you into thinking about things which are horrible or good or even uh, um, uh, you know things which you normally won't think in your daily life so that that you know when i look at civilizational wars when i look at wars which have taken because uh, which have uh, happened because of the need to conquer and if i think back to that you know and then i look at petty crimes or daily crimes in you know present day uh in the present day i mean there are issues where you know we have seen in in our own state some uh triple mur- murders happening and and uh, it's horrible to think about and uh in spite of that uh, if you look at um some of the cases you know because of certain issues because of certain reasons we are not able to articulate uh the murderers have escaped there are um reasons which are beyond imagination why people uh, kill each other and those are themes we need to address and and i feel that uh, unless um your conscience is pricked you will not be able to address um, and understand those issues 
So that's one of the reasons why I want to bring out, you know, something horrible, something gruesome and uh, uh, and something unimaginable. So that, you know, even your fear is shaken. Even your beliefs are also disturbed. Unless you are able to do that to your reader. I think uh, sometimes it is an attempt to engage your reader. So if you are engaging your reader, you must, I think, um, uh, you know, sometimes shake their uh, minds. But definitely, you know, as I said in the beginning, I write for myself mostly. Okay. And, and because I publish, you know, the moment it gets published, even though you wrote for yourself, it is no longer within that domain. It goes out, you know, and then uh, people are uh, free to come and read and even react. Yeah. So, yeah, that's one of the reasons why I feel that. I need to bring this out, you know, to this point. I hope no murderer goes to heaven, though. <laughs> Let's see. Mm. And, uh, yeah, I also wanted to talk about one poem uh, uh, called uh, Rain Prayer. Rain Prayer, yeah. Tell me. Yeah. Because when I re read this poem, mm. I read it in a very, I in imagined a very fairy tale-ish thing. There's a frog waiting for rain. It reminded me of the Frog Princess also somehow. Very, <laughs> I, I was kind of in a happy mood, you know, when yeah. I read this poem. Then I went to Nagaland mm. and I learned a lot about the geographical feature and the mm. cultures of Nagaland. I know that uh, River Doyang is one of the main rivers of the state and I know it flows through Wokha district. Yeah. I, I kind of have a great, not great, I kind of have good knowledge about, you know, mm. uh, that uh, the terrain. And after reading that, uh, I feel this is like a little bit of history preserved also, like general knowledge also. Maybe I the respect for this poem increased. Mm. So I kind of uh, took away uh, this thing from that, that we should go visit places. We, we should learn about people's, other people's culture. Yeah. So that is what Rain Bear made me feel. Mm. And I wanted to share that. Yeah, one of my favorite poems also. Wow. And if you want to say a little, say a little bit about uh, the Rain Prayer and River Doyang for our audience, so that they know more about uh, uh, the geography of Nagaland, Mokha district, please go ahead. Sir. So, um, in any place uh, or any state or any country, you know, uh, some of the uh, landmarks of that place remain, and and. Uh, even though people come and go and you know, generations and generations change, some of the landmarks remain. And uh, it defines the people around uh, those, you know, uh, landmarks. Doyang is one such uh, river. It is uh, the largest river. And uh, it has been dammed uh, in, in the 90s. And it's mm -hmm. the... Um, of course, it generates only 75 megawatts, but it is the largest hydro project in Nagaland till date. And uh, um, the course of uh, my people's history has uh, always been around River Doyan. Either you are rafting down to Brahmaputra from Doyan, because it's one of the tributaries, or you are. Um, trying to cross the Doyang River over a hanging bridge. But it is the sustainer of the entire agricultural, mm, you know, uh, yes. belt in, in Wokha district. So it is what makes Wokha district very uh, fertile. And my district is known as the land of plenty. In, in oh, yeah. yeah, so we have all kinds of organic uh, production, and agriculture is uh, the mainstay of the district. So, you know, when you have, um, when you refer to river with reverence, and because we, because before Christianity came, we were animist, and we were um, worshipping nature, and uh, uh, forests and rivers being one. So we hold it with special reverence. And that uh, became part of our culture. And, and therefore, uh, uh, 
it is never dry, but uh, you know, I'm imagining a position where if it is dry, what will happen to the culture? Yeah. What will happen to you know our our place? So I refer to the widow because of that. I refer to her because you know um, a widow is uh, representative of you know um, any person will identify with a widow uh, and her challenges. And then we will understand, uh, I mean, we can uh, identify in the sense we can understand uh, the, the position. So how the widow deals with life. It is just symbolic, of course. Uh, it's not about a person. Uh, I'm just looking at, uh, you know, the mother who is revered, and the river who is revered as a mother is now imagined as the widow. So just uh, on that line, you know, the, the river Doyang is uh, um, something which defines a lot of our, uh, even, even our language, you know, okay. even geography of Boka district is like whether you're above Doyang or below Doyang. So it has been part of our culture, our lang language ever since. So, uh, and, and the fact that uh, even though, uh, you know, generations have come and gone, the river is still there. So it's one point which uh, I, uh, of course, I uh, address that uh, subject differently, but uh, it's one, po one point which reflects that aspect of the river. Yes, yes, Mr. Kikon, River Duyang beautifully captured uh, in your poetry. I think these are the poems which I wanted to talk about uh, in, in a given time. Because there are lots of, uh, this, this book is full of uh, lots of good poetry and... Uh, Can I ask you about your poetry? Yeah, <laughs> yes, yes, please. Yes. So, uh, uh, you, you have been writing poems for a very long time and uh, uh, although it's not necessary that you are a literature student like uh, me who write poems. Mm, yeah. poems uh, poets also have different professions, actually. Uh, yeah. And I don't think, you know, there are very, very rarely, you know, few people who make a livelihood out of uh, writing poems. It is a passion. Mm. And you, as a history student and a historian, very passionate about poetry and you write. So in your book, In Finite Days to Come, which was released this year, um, I, I wanted to ask you, I mean, two of my favorite, I've already told you, Purest Tears and The Queen of the Night. Mm -hmm. And um, so I would like to introduce your poem to the audience by asking you this question. Why did you write The Queen of the Night and what were you thinking of when you wrote that? But if you want to read uh, both of them, I would request you to read. And then yeah, you I will. First, I'll read The Queen of the Night. Mm. Uh, the title is The Queen of the Night. It goes like this. The sweet scented cactus in full bloom on the starlit light, star starlit night, no moon. The sweet fragrance it gives out, oh loud, quite loud to the mind. Its wide, bright beauty fills up the senses, clears the mind. Not quite a beauty in daylight, the queen of the night's beauty is only for a few who are up at night, looking amazingly beautiful in the starlit night, the queen tonight. I wrote this poem way back in uh, 2008. It was a long time back. Uh, and it's in our really garden, long. in our a very long time ago and we had this uh, the name of the flower is the queen of the night oh. we had this flower in our garden it's it, it blooms on a cactus i think it is also called bethlehem flower yes. it only blooms in the night it only blooms in the night and it's so beautiful and the mm -hmm. fragrance is so nice so it was uh, that was the inspiration behind it like nothing deep is going on there mm. so that was the inspiration behind it i thought daytime it's not that pretty night it's so mm -hmm. pretty but then uh, people who are asleep, you know, by the time will not see its beauty. So for us in Somnax, we mm -hmm. have this flower. That yeah, is the to, idea. I wanted to ask you about that because uh, this is a poem where there are three things which, uh, uh, 
impressed me. Number one, you're playing with uh, words which is trying very um, elaborately to differentiate the uh, differences between night and day, light and dark. Uh, also, it, re it reminded me of uh, Edgar Allan Poe's uh, poem, The Raven. And because you mentioned insomnia, uh, usually people who um, are insomniacs <laughs> stay up late and you know do something like reading, writing, uh, or watching a movie these days. So uh, it's about a beautiful flower, which is, whose beauty is uh, fully expressed only in the night. So you know yeah, that. Yeah. So many people will not know about it. Yeah, that metaphor uh, is, is something which uh, really struck me. Is it because uh, uh, it has any relation with, you know, um, at that point of time, your life? Or you just wrote it because, you know, it's your impression of the flower and you liked it. And as you said, it was outside your uh, kitchen, uh, you know, garden. But there must be something deep about why you wrote about it in this manner. Because, you know, the entire effort has been to bring out the difference between light and dark. But then you are writing about a subject which blooms only in the night. Yeah, yeah maybe perhaps because I remember those days I used to, uh, I, I, I had trouble sleeping. Mm. I used to sleep the whole day. I think a bit depressive phase kind of a thing. So mm -hmm. every, every time the flower bloomed, I used to go out and check it. And mm. yeah, so and then that that that's what I also realized that my friends must be sleeping. I'm awake here, looking at the flower. Mm. So perhaps that, but it was written a long time ago. So sometimes you kind of forget why you wrote certain something. But so yes, who, it, it was based on the book uh, on the flower which uh, grew in my garden. Who is the queen of the night, you or the flower? The flower. Oh. But yes, wow, that's a very nice way to think about it. Yeah, perhaps me also, <laughs> because <laughs> yeah, I, I would like to say me, but yeah, yeah, I, it was the flower, it was the flower. Yeah, before I go on to the next question, uh, I want you to read out the purest tears. Purest tears. Yeah. Purest tears. The tears you cry alone are the purest when you know that no God is watching. Mm. Purest tears. So, you know, why I uh, wanted you to read that out is because I'm intrigued by your use of the word purest for tears. So, yes. Um, there are impure tears and pure tears, or uh, is that a way of differentiating between different kinds of tears? Um, so there are crocodile tears also, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Like you, using your tears to get favors and stuff. Mm -hmm. And so I believe like when we cry alone, like when we, we cry sometimes to let people know what we are feeling. So and when, you when we're very sad. It. Sorry, sorry. When did you write this? This one, uh, I guess 2016, 17. So that's like eight years after you wrote The Queen of the Night. Yes. Yeah. So, so yeah. Now, looking, about the, yeah. Uh, yeah, looking back, um, yeah. you know, 16, 17, purest, purest tears. And because it's so short, mm -hmm. um, was there something which happened to you that you wrote this? Uh, I must have been uh, sad, of course. Uh, this this one shows a lot of hopelessness and helplessness. Uh -huh. I can see that. And this this is short, but I think this is one of my most favorite poems in the book because uh -huh. again, I'm bearing my soul out for everyone to see. Yeah. So when we when we cry, when we cry, we want to cry in front of people we love, so that they understand our emotions. But sometimes we want to cry alone. Mm. Like we don't want anyone to see it. But we know that, you know, some, some, some higher power must be watching over us, mm. will value our tears. But when you cry, knowing that there is no one, 
I think that is like your lowest state of hopelessness. You are just crying because you are done. Mm. No one, no God, no one is watching over you. No one is going to do anything about your tears. You're just crying because that's the only thing you can do. So I think that's why I called it purest tears. Mm. And and was there a particular time when you cried, like in the morning, in the night? And after the act of crying, uh, did it help you? Did it, uh, you know, at least manage to uh, calm you? Of course, of course, of course, Mr. Kikon. Crying always helps. <laughs> crying always relieves you of, you know, all kinds of tension. Crying always helps. The people should cry. People mm -hmm. should cry. People should, like, even if they don't want to cry in front of people, go and cry alone somewhere. But uh, crying uh, is a hum it's a very human act. No, it shows that you're human. So you should cry too, Mr. Kikon. <laughs> you <should> cry too. <laughs> uh, thank you for your suggestion. Uh, I, I, I was, uh, I mean, I wanted to uh, ask you this question because, you know, uh, as a poet um, and a historian, um, you are expressing, you know, uh, your emotions, and articulating it uh, in the form of poems, and and you are very happy and you know um, you know calm about it. It's uh, it's something which you take uh, you know naturally. So, in your opinion, um, do you think that uh, all your poems have some element of uh, you know honesty? some element of, uh, you know, raw truth, you know, in, in the way you write about uh, things. Yes, yes, Mr. Kikon, because I believe that if a writer is not honest, mm. what's the point? Yeah. What's the point of writing? What's the point of reading someone's dishonest writing? Mm. So, and sometimes honesty also takes a lot of toll on us because we are showing ourselves, like our, our whole self to the world. But then I also take it... Uh, in a way that we are courageous, mm. courageous. You know, we are showing our saddest selves so that when people read it, they find courage in it. So it's, mm. it, I think we are poets are really poets, honest poets are good people. Mm. And also, when someone writes dishonestly, it shows. Mm. Readers know when someone is dishonest about their writing, mm -hmm. because I, I'm, I'm foremost a reader, and yeah. I know when a writer is being dishonest. So. Yeah. That's a very nice, relevant question, Mr. Kikon. And yes, I, I, I'm honest in, and raw. In yeah, I, I, I get that point. I get that point. Because today, in this age and time, I mean, uh, this known, um, you know, uh, hard and fast rule that you should publish your poems okay. in a book form. Uh, there are so many millions of people bringing out their poems on Instagram, on Twitter, on Facebook, and it's all over social media. And, and uh, sometimes it's just an expression. It's definitely not uh, confined to the need for publishing, uh, but to express and to share, you know, your poetry with your limited circles or also to your friends and followers, maybe. And therefore, I was asking you this question that, you know, you, you put it very well. I mean, there are writers who we know as readers write uh, you know truthfully and uh, who also you know write poetry in a way which explores the meaning of life and challenges us to think about you know things that we previously had no idea or were not interested in thinking or we're not invested in reflecting on so i think uh, i don't know would you agree that uh, you know in finite days to come is uh, it's not you know because since you've written it over a period of ten years, mm -hmm. I am um, I'm thinking that um, the different emotions that you bring up, say for instance, Queen of the Nine and Furious Tears are eight years apart. However, the expression has been truthful. You know, there is real truth in all the poems that you write. But then, as you have uh, responded, uh, there's this um, sometimes, you know, uh, poems you write eight years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years back, comes back to you and speaks to you in a different manner because mm -hmm. times have changed and situations have changed. 
ഒരു ന്യൂ എക്സിസ്റ്റ് ഐ അഗ്രി ഐ അഗ്രി സംടൈംസ് देयर आर पोएम्स व्हिच आई राइट एंड आई गो बैक एंड आई थिंक दिस इज नॉट गुड बट देन आई डोंट डिसरिस्पेक्ट दैट पोएम बिकॉज़ दैट वाज माय ट्रूथ देन आई लुक एट इट लाइक दैट सो या so generally you know i i just feel i have this feeling that when we discuss poetry i mean we are from you're from manipur i'm from nagaland we're from different regions but you know poetry speaks to humanity it's not about geography it's not about region you know and every culture in the world uh, is is uh, you know uh, has produced uh, many poets and will produce so in your case uh, as a woman and as a historian and as a poet from manipur how do you define your poetry and your relation to your poems um i just write what i i just write what i want to write and mm. of course it will be related to the place i stay because uh, uh, many of my poems are reactionary as a reaction to what is happening in my state or as a reaction to what is happening in women in the world so uh, my book of poem is in two parts uh, and the first part has a sub part called f word mm. when i say the f word i mean feminism because it's a very misunderstood word so okay. the so your question your question on my being a women poet yeah. i think that part will answer it all it's all full of anger uh. it's all full of anger mm. it's, a, it's a lot of anger expressed as a women poet i'm an angry poet mm. as a women poet um i i think i want to put it that way yeah i saw a lot of angst and angu- anguish in your poetry and i yeah. i feel that uh, uh, it's it's since the collection of poems for over a period of 10 years i would wish that you would write in your next book a uh, book of hope and joy uh, happiness book of hope <laughs> yes <laughs> Uh, definitely definitely mr spider yeah yeah and co- coming to that uh what are your plans mr kikon as far as po- more poetry pu- publications are concerned and as far as writing is concerned i know i mean because i've published three or a period of four years uh three book of poems uh, it is natural for me or for anybody think that i'll again publish you know book of poems uh i i just spend time writing poetry because it helps me uh overcome stress and it helps me think clearly and also it elevates me to um, you know a level which i always aspire to reach you know in terms of spirituality and therefore it is something which uh, i need most and more than anyone else therefore it's not about publishing when i say i write for myself uh i keep writing every day everywhere when i get uh, you know the opportunity and because now we have technology to aid us you know i can write a poem in my smartphone and come and edit it later uh, just to find meaning to to the thought at that moment that i would be going through so in the it, it's not really planned but i keep writing and also uh, whenever i get a chance and i try to uh, make time to read more and more books and you know because i've uh, always been reading novels which is fiction and also non fiction a lot of uh, books on politics and history and all that uh, i would uh, i would say that now i'm reading more poetry uh, than any other genre and i'm liking it so let's see what comes out of it um uh, and i would like to also uh, share that i'm writing on hope and peace hope and uh, mostly i mean those are the two themes that i decided i'll devote my time to so uh, and and that that's why i asked you whether you would write about hope and joy and happiness hope. in your next uh, book of poems which i'm sure you will write do you uh, maybe i will read your book on hope and peace first and talk about <laughs> it <laughs> and uh, yeah i mean uh, i also was looking forward to this conversation because you know we are from two different states um uh, two different cultures um there is this uh, issue of uh, 
um, the fact that we're neighbors. And uh, I always believe that uh, you can make friends, but God gives you neighbors. So it's, it's uh, you know, something I always uh, say, but uh, I feel that that's true. And in our poetry, we deal with different teams, but I think, uh, you know, uh, mm, we are from a region where uh, we are the borders, you know, okay. in a way. And, and we come up with poetry, which uh, generally deals with themes humanity is dealing with. I mean, I find that beautiful. So thank you um, for uh, uh, being part of this uh, conversation. And uh, so I would like to say that uh, uh, there should be more representation and more having this kind of conversation from every part of india and uh, of yeah that's that's uh, something i look forward to in the days to come so uh, as a concluding um uh, as a concluding question um any advice uh, you would like to give to the younger generation of poets uh, in India and in Northeast. Um, I think there's no dirt of advice for uh, younger poets, but uh, if you were to ask me, I would say that we should uh, read more, write more, and uh, be living witnesses to our uh, own history and culture. And, um, uh, you know, definitely uh, poets are a blessing to any society. And um, if you look through history, um, people, you know, civilizations have come and gone. But what remained is, you know, their literature, their history. Their literature. And uh, mostly, uh, poets add meaning to people's life and history and it's very important that uh, we have uh, uh, we promote a uh, lot more poets you know everywhere in the country thank what you. Will you what will you leave your audience with uh read a lot read a lot read a lot mm. and write later mm. i think every every poet every writer should be a reader first and then have confidence in what you write yeah. write the truth and be honest which we already discussed be honest be honest in your writings and that's it so thank you dr Susma. yeah thank you thank you Mr. yeah